Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started, I guess. We have some customers who use the kind of I'm looking forward to the, the new version. Okay. So, come on. Let's, let's, go ahead. Oh, okay, no, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to talk about OpenStack. This is um, Dan Prince, and, and, I'm, and I'm Russell Bryant. So Dan's uh, going to talk most about you know, OpenStack itself, the internals, how it works, and so forth. And now it's going to make some comments about the status of OpenStack uh, in Fedora after that. So okay. go for it, Dan. Thank you. Okay, so I'm Dan Prince. I work for Rackspace, and I actually live in Blacksburg, so it was extremely convenient for me to come over here this morning and hang out with you guys. I think all conferences should be in town, this is great. But, um, anyway, um, just... Um, Who are you? Stand over here. So yeah, this, one, this is a talk uh, about OpenStack internals, so it's kind of a mixed bag talk just to go over some of the various pieces in OpenStack. Um, the, about you know the services and stuff. So I guess just to start off, you know, OpenStack is an open source. Uh, it's an open source um, cloud um, computing platform that you can use to run, um, you know, your own private cloud or like you know fairly large service providers like Rackspace are also using to run public clouds. Yeah. So some of the pieces we'll go over today are actually um, you know deployed right now in production and you know, being used at scale. So. You know, pretty um, uh, battle-tested stuff. So, uh, I guess just just a high-level intro um, to some of the, the services in Open in OpenStack. Um, and um, on this screen, the first three are actually in the Fedora 16 release, that, that which was based off of the um, OpenStack Diablo um, release. Um, so, you know, just starting off, Nova Compute, that's the compute service. Um, uh, Swift Object Storage, that's, um, you know, that's actually a component that, you know, correspond with cloud files or S3 if you're familiar with those services. Um, and then Glance is the image storage service, um, you know, so that's going to, you know, provide like image, you know, provide a way for, uh, you know, compute images to, uh, to be obtained in a scalable, fast fashion, or fast fashion. Um, and then, you know, the bottom three are um, being added right now or have already been added, and those will go into the Essex release of OpenStack. So, um, Keystone is the authentication service. So, previously, authentication was kind of baked into Nova, just as a, no, Nova was kind of a, a catch-all service, and it contained a lot of you know, authentication and, you know, some of the networking configuration and stuff. And so it's being split out into separate services. So, um, so, so some of the auth stuff is, is now, um, you know, standalone service. And uh, net, you know, network service components, there's two new projects, Melange and Quantum. Um, I am not the expert on networking stuff, but Melange is more like the level three, layer three network stuff, and, and Quantum is more like the layer two. Like your network's connected. So there's two separate services there that are they're going to be part of OpenStack. And then Horizon is a dashboard that um, you know can be used as kind of a front end web app or you know UI for for the entire set. If, if you guys want to ask questions along the way, I'm I'm cool with that. So. So when you say Nova is the compute portion of it, is that the service that runs on the nodes that are the hypervisors? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nova would actually run, you know, where you're running, if you're using Libvirt or KVM, it would run on that machine, or if you're using Zen Server, and so on and so on. So, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so just a little, a little bit of background. I mean, so the project, it's hosted on GitHub. You can go under slash OpenStack and get it all. It's almost mostly written in Python. You know, there's some, some niche pieces that are in other languages. Um, and then those line counts are a bit old, but I just thought, I always think it's interesting to see how many, how much code is actually there, just as, you know, if you want to jump in. So, not a huge code base, but, you know, I would say um, it's, some of the projects are very easy to jump into and, and contribute. Um, this is just kind of a catch-all slide, um, you know, when I, you know, as a developer setting up OpenStack, these are some of the, the, the different things you're going to be using. Um, you know, so there's a Rabbit queue that's, that we use as our message queue. You, know, you can you can use different databases. So like Nova has a database. Um, I would say MySQL is probably the most popular choice, but Postgres can be used um, as well. Um, SQLite probably not so much in production, but you know for development it, it works pretty well. Um, 
The uh, hypervisor support, you know, the most popular hypervisor. Hy hypervisors are KVM and Zen Server, but um, there are people using it with VMware as well. And um, also Hyper-V, I didn't have that in the list. But you, I think the support for, for you know, other hypervisors is it, for, for, for some of the um, VMware and, and uh, Hyper-V is added through the version, so that, that layer kind of covers that. Um, and then, you know, authentication can be backed with LDAP optionally. The, you know, Keystone can use a, a MySQL database, or the back end can use LDAP too. Um, and then, you know, networking, you're gonna, if, if you, so Nova has the ability to do VLAN configuration. Uh, it depends on which network manager you use, but if you, you know, have, if you want to, if you want to manage it yourself and just, you know, have like a, what's called, we call it flat network model in use, you can do that, which just means, you know, you're managing all that stuff, or you can use just, we have a DHCP network manager as well. So, you know, that's kind of just some catch-all stuff there. Is um, there any analytics piece to that? Does the group have anything to do with this? Um, not specifically, but there are, um, you know, within the, the Nova and, you know, Glance, there's some notifications and stuff that, you know, uh, the, ser the services themselves would, you know, put uh, messages onto the queue that, you know, other services could listen to for analytical purposes. Does that make sense? Like, so I guess, like, you know, if you're, you, if, if, uh, if, if you're wanting to charge people for, you know, network or compute usage, then you could listen for those types of messages and, and then build off that. But there isn't any specific service right now. So you can use that for discovery, you're saying? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so I guess just this is kind of more focused on how you would, once you set up OpenStack, this is kind of, you know, um, talking about the APIs. One of the interesting things about the projects is that it actually has two APIs. Um, it actually has a um, kind of a, so so the Rackspace, the, the, the Diablo release had a Rackspace 1.0 style API, I would call it, and then a EC2 style API. Um, the, the upcoming Essex release has a, it's, it, it's now just called the OpenStack API, but it's, it's just a V2 OpenStack API and also still an EC2 API. So um, the project is really, it, it's kind of interesting from that standpoint because you can actually, you know, use, um, you know, from a client side, I can actually use the tools to spin up an instance in OpenStack, or I can use, you know, my, you know, Ruby compute, OpenStack compute binding to spin up an instance with OpenStack using the, the OpenStack API. So, you know, it's, it's, it's meant to be, you know, it, that's kind of a, a an easy way to make, because those are very, two very popular public clouds, so those APIs, um, a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, the, so so that, that's how the external side, you know, user would interact through those two APIs, then underneath, underneath that, you know, everything is going to be sent through the, serve, through the message queue between the services. So like, you know, when the API servers get a request, you know, that's going to go to the message queue and then, you know, either, you know, the scheduler is going to pick that up and then it's going to choose a compute host and, and that's going to happen. I'll, I'll show a diagram of that in a second. Um, but essentially all these services, you know, you know, computes, networks, schedulers, images, and APIs are communicating, you know, just uh, across the message queue. Um, and it would look, you know, something like this. Um, this doesn't have in it the newer parts of OpenStack, but um, you know, just you know, the laptop over there being an end user, you could either you know communicate with the object store API or the you know the API endpoints for compute, and then that the, the services within OpenStack would then kind of you know communicate with each other through the queue, and, and that's kind of how um, a typical deployment would work. You know, within OpenStack. So I guess just now switching gears a little bit to talk about. Um, you know, the OpenStack API, which is is now at version two, um, it's in, it's got a RESTful JSON and XML implementation. Um, the uh, if if you want to, you can extend it. So you know, if you're if you're a service provider and you have like um, you know just extra things you want to add on to the, the, the API endpoints or you know whatever, you can do that. Um, you know, I would say it's extensible from an auth perspective. It's extensible from a you know, like what gets returned perspective. Um, 
and then there's you know there's also limits. So you, you have the ability to limit users to you know say like you know you can create uh, 60 servers per hour or whatever. So you know there's mechanism to limit you. There's mechanism to limit by memory and and limit by hits. So you know that that's just to kind of um, keep things in check. Um, and you know, th there's controllers for each resource. So, in, you know, in Nova, there's a slash server, and slash images, and slash flavors, and, and, and so on and so on. Um, any, any questions about like the OpenStack API? Is anybody familiar with the? Yeah. yeah. So, so I understand the the concept of extensions. What is that going to do for you from a proliferation standpoint when you're trying to have, you know, some of the abstraction layers like JClouds or or Fog? Uh, abstract that away. If people have, especially dominant players, have uh, have added their own extensions to do things, uh, what's that going to do from a cluttering up the space and oh, this isn't going to work except for core functionality. Right. You can't do everything with my abstraction layer. So the extensions, um, when you write an extension, you're supposed to use uh, your, uh, in, you know, a namespace assigned to that extension. So like for example, if you've written an extension to return extra data off of a get to servers, like if you're doing a get on the server and you're returning some extra data, then that will <coughs> go into a separate namespace. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, I guess, you know, if you have bindings or whatever, if your bindings would just um, you know, be written to look at things within the namespace. So I would say um, there's a little bit of ambiguity there as far as like if someone writing a binding for a specific provider goes kind of across that line and does something outside of the namespace, then you know there is potential where you know it might not work on another private cloud. Right. <coughs> so I'll look at bindings. Take a break. Okay. Cool. So, um, well, he, uh, I'll, let me, I want to jump over and uh, he mentioned a bit about uh, OpenStack being in Fedora and what version it was in. So, um, let me cover that a bit more just to kind of give you uh, uh, an update on the status of that. So, um, OpenStack and Fedora, uh, the current status and some things that are ongoing. Um, all right. So, how many people are on the cloud SIG mailing list? Cool. So, um, Anyone else, if you're not already on that list and you're interested in OpenStack and other things in Fedora, then I'd certainly recommend getting on that list. Um, it seems to be picking up that activity and interesting things. Uh, Mark McLaughlin uh, has been posting uh, some posts there every once in a while, getting some updates on the status of OpenStack and Fedora. The latest one, well, subject OpenStack status, I don't think he's not, yeah, not trying to hide it. Uh, it was on January 10th, and it goes into uh, quite a bit of detail. Um, about uh, various updates that have been done. So check that out if you want some gory details. Um, Dan mentioned that uh, OpenStack was first added to Fedora 16. It is the uh, Diablo release of, of, of OpenStack, which uh, was released uh, last year. And we also had a test day, which was, uh, which was very successful. A number of people showed up. Um, Got OpenStack installed. We found some packaging bugs. Um, but I also want to mention the test day because I found, I personally found the test day um, really helpful for because the, the test day happened about the time I was first just first started looking at OpenStack at all. So I found it useful just to learn about OpenStack. So that's another thing. Even um, even though that test day has passed, it's kind of it's a resource you can look at and learn a little bit about some some, some, some detailed steps you can follow to get started. So Fedora 17, um, it's it, OpenStack is going to get updated to the Essex release, which I believe is in um, March or April or something like that. April. April, okay. Um, so in, in addition to the uh, few core projects that were part of Diablo, uh, there's going to be some other things added. Uh, Quantum, the new networking service, Horizon, the new, new uh, GUI dashboard. Uh, there's a te another test day scheduled. It's March 8th. Um, so we're going to expand the test cases. Yep. Uh, Keystone won't be out of though? Uh, Keystone too. I just wasn't accidentally left it off. Yeah. I, I, I must have been thinking that was already in there, but it wasn't. So Keystone will be out as well. Um, 
another test day, so we've got some, if anyone is interested in like helping, you know, uh, with, with some of the stuff in Fedora, the, the helping with this next test day is one area that you can help with. Um, the test cases that are there now, we kind of covered testing the, the Nova package and plans, I think, but uh, not Swift, which was there, but just didn't really test it. Uh, and if you want to check out the Fedora 17 feature page, uh, it's the Fedora project wiki, but the other URL is this, wiki features uh, OpenStack Essex. And this feature page links to some sort of sub-feature pages that cover some other things um, that are getting done. They're sort of really sort of sub-features of that. Um, it's also in uh, Apple 6. So, and that. Um, so, and it, I just want to mention some other stuff that, that some Cloud Sync members are doing. So in addition to packaging for, for Fedora, there's, there's some Cloud Sync members doing um, other work that's just upstream at OpenStack. Um, stable branch maintenance, that, that's, that's primarily Mark McLaughlin. Again, he's, he's been uh, doing a lot of work with uh, helping maintain the uh, Diablo release, backboarding, both fixes, that sort of stuff, which the Fedora 16 package is based on. Um, LibGuestFS, um, it's, it's, it's a really cool project for being able to um, open up disk images and modify them, um, introspect them, and so forth. So that was something that that's um, that actually Kari Brady added for uh, yeah. 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 a new way to do um, file, yeah, to inject files. Mm -hmm. um, Cupid support is a patch that uh, that I did with uh, William Henry that. I just posted that up, upstream a few days ago. So um, Dan mentioned a while ago that the OpenStack infrastructure uses RabbitMQ uh, as, as the AMQP stuff, and this is an alternative to that. So Qubit's an Apache project um, for AMQP. So that's getting added. And, and other stuff, like I said, if you can check out that um, status post and mailing list, we need some more. Yeah. For LibGuestFS, you, know, you said it's able to open up disk mm -hmm. images to do file injection. Is that primarily used as uh, provisioning tools? So you, in order to get a new image booted up, you may need to inject some configuration information to get it started. Yeah, exactly. So, so Dan, you know, I, I've got some slides on that later. Okay, cool. So, but yeah, I believe it's, um, so, yeah. like, exactly, adding, adding, um, like, network config, that kind of stuff. Got I think, I think it's, like, it's adding, um, network config and, like, SSH keys or something like that, right? So, yeah. Why are you not doing that with cloud net? Um, well, that's, like, another way that can be done. Well, so that would require like a metadata search, right? Right. So your so, DHCP so, box, right? Right. But not all not all network topologies in OpenStack have that capability. Okay. Uh, what there is, you can use cloud. You can use cloud net for some other. I'm just saying. It's not always. Yeah, I don't think it's always used. It's, it's like if if your setup is such that you have to do file injection to get stuff done. Um, just a couple more things, uh, or one more slide, and then I'll turn it back over to Dan. Um, so, so I mean, there's lots of documentation upstream, but I wanted to point to a couple of, uh, or a few things that are just Fedora related. Um, well, actually, if you look at some of the upstream documentation, um, a lot of it doesn't, like it, it talks about Ubuntu, but not Fedora, so there's there's a lot of stuff that, uh, I guess, Fedora Cloud members are helping with there, um, adding Fedora bits uh, to the documentation there. But also, there's a wiki page on the Fedora wiki, getting started with OpenStack Node. Like, if you get to, there's a lot of information on getting it installed on Fedora. And I, and I also recommend the test day test cases on it, because they're nice and organized, and, and I find it helpful for it. Not really nice. yeah. So, shift back. All right. All right. Sorry. I uh, will try to slow down a little bit so I can last another half an hour. But, <laughs> Extent, so to, just to get back to the extension, so um, to answer your question again, I think you know the namespace thing solves some of the problem, and you know um, I would say that the extensions are also queryable. There's an extensions endpoint, so you know from, from an end user perspective, you know if I want an extension for key pairs, which there is an extension for key pairs, the binding can query for key pairs, and if they're there, make use of it. If not, then, you know, it would just not have a key. All right. So I'm thinking largely in the in public private split. So if I have my private Nova instance running, but I also want to be running stuff on, you know, Rackspace when they get Nova up and running or Mercado Libre or whoever, um, if I want to uh, if I want to move stuff and they have um, non 
OpenStack uh, extensions in their OpenStack API. Sure. How do I deal with that, especially if I start making use of it? You know, it provides some cool functionality I really want. Suddenly, I've I've lost the ability to do that. Do well, the I same thing. I would say so. The extensions are meant. So if it is that critical, if it's that key of a feature, then it should be on its way into the core eight, to the core set, right? I mean. Well, I mean theoretically, but it, I mean if if said cloud provider had some awesome feature and didn't want to commit it to the rest of the world. You know, they don't necessarily have an incentive to, to do so, um, and you know, we're, especially with Apache license stuff, there there is certainly that precedence for keep that on on our side of the firewall rather than pushing it out. So yeah, I mean, I would say this is a mechanism to allow people to extend. Yeah, and, and I think I think being able to extend. My question is, is it is it going to be a problem when people start adding their own functionality? I don't know. I would like to see. I would like to see it go more the other way, as you know, people add extensions because there's a core feature that's not there and they need it now. And right. Then, but they also work with the community to get that back into the project. And then I think, you know, hopefully that cycle will be self-correcting as far as the problem that you're mentioning. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, so I, I, you know, I can see that happening on, on a shorter time frame, but then hopefully it corrects itself. Um, so. Anyway, you know, so that, that's the OpenStack side of the API. It's the most featureable um, API in, in, the, in the project. Um, and then, you know, just to, to go over some of the things about the EC2 API, so I would, just, just from a high level, I would say, you know, if you're looking at the EC2 API in OpenStack, it's really more focused on functionality than it is on correctness. So if you're looking at the API and saying, you know, um, does this fully implement the spec to, you know, to the letter, I would say probably not, but it implements the spec so that, you know, a majority of the popular tools work with it. Um, so, um, you know, so, you know, some of the things, you, you can boot instances, you can put, you can, you know, upload your AMIs, you know, you can use, you know, some of the command line tools, you know, um, Yuka tools, Bodo, um, you know, it, it's an XML API and, you know, you know, the authentication, there, there is middleware to allow it to work with Keystone. So you can still use um, the EC2 API when you're using Keystone. So any questions on the EC2 API? I would say I'm not the expert on the EC2 API, because I work for Rackspace, but <laughs> I know a bit about it. Um, um, just so, you know, another one of the services in OpenStack that's um, very interesting is the scheduler, and that is what decides where things are going to get. You know, provision. So, you know, you've got all these hypervisors, and you um, want to decide where the instances are going to get split. So, you know, just just a, I would, you know, like like a lot of things in OpenStack, I would say that this is a pluggable thing. So, you could actually write your own scheduler here if you had some, you know, algorithm that you really liked as far as you know, uh, filling up nodes first or you know, spreading things out better. But you know some of the ones that are in there by default. There's a, you know a simple scheduler, um, and then there's a, you know a chance scheduler that just kind of does things randomly, and then there's a distributed scheduler which does you know things kind of based on zones in OpenStack. And so I, I got another slide we can talk about what zones are and how you use those. But, um, so um, zones are a mechanism in Nova to help. It, it, you know, it's really to help scale Nova um, for performance issues and network limitations. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's basically a zone is, you know, a grouping of all the services, you know, from back when we started. Just to, so a zone would typically contain, you know, like all the, the, the services in OpenStack. Um, you know, a zone, zones can actually contain other zones, so that, that maybe gets a, a little more complicated. Um, but it, it's also a useful way to split up capabilities. So, um, you know, one example would be like, you know, if you're running, you know, one hypervisor to support your Windows instances, and you're running another hypervisor for your Linux instances, then this would be a way to split it up and manage it. So you have you know, an API request coming in and splitting it up um, down the road. So compute. Now getting to the fun stuff. So the compute service is the service that actually, um, you know, it runs your instances, terminates your instances, reboots instances, attaches volumes. It's it's basically the service that, inter that interacts with the hypervisor 
in Nova. Um, and you know, like um, the two, you know, the two most popular I would say are you know KVM and Zen Server. Um, I'm more, from, I'm a little more familiar with Zen Server with the better <coughs> rack spaces if you do, internally, but um, you know the the Libvirt is, um, it, you know, I guess as far as private cloud seems to be uh, the most popular as well. Um, so you know with Libvirt, you know KVM, QMU, you can use. Um, some of the, I guess, proprietary ones, Hyper-V, Zen, and Viewer as well. Um, you know, the interface for LibVirt's may be a little more generic so that um, some of the things like, um, there's an API feature in OpenStack to inject files, for example. Um, you know, it's called personalities. And that isn't necessarily supported on all of the hypervisors here. Um, and there are various ways to go about doing file injection. Um, you know, one of them would be, you know, I guess using something like libguestfs. Um, you know, another one would be to use an agent-based approach. And another one would be to use maybe like, you know, a cloud init type setup where you have a metadata service and you, you have the instance contacting the metadata service to get, you know, key value pairs or things and stuff. So, um, you know, I would say that um, in OpenStack, one of the areas that needs improvement is parity across the hypervisors as far as this kind of feature set. Like, you know, when you have the external API, um, you know, exposing a feature that not all of the hypervisors can actually support. And then, um, one of the things that libvirt does support that Zen server doesn't is um, live migrations, which is pretty cool. So, um, and then, um, I guess, you know, so Zen, Zen server, um, uh, I think it works with 6.0, but which is in beta, I believe. Um, we have some guys um, testing around that with that. Um, but I, I've used 5.6 SP2. Um, and um, I guess you know the interesting thing about deploying OpenStack with Zen server is that um, there's there are a couple of different ways to run it, but what, what you typically would do is you would run the Nova compute service in a DOM U, not the DOM zero, on the on the Zen server box. And it would communicate with the host, the DOM zero via Zen API. Um, <coughs> and then, and then the way that when it when it's communicating with the host, it's using plugins that are actually installed in DOM zero to do things like download the image, um, you know, configure the network diffs, and you know, bring the instance up and all that. Um, and then there's uh, this hypervisor. Uh, or you know, Zen server is probably one of the more fully featured. You know, it supports um, you know the, the file injection and the metadata and stuff and, and all that in, in the OS API. Um, it uses Zen store to communicate with that. Um, I would I would say there's a couple of alternatives to using Zen store on the table in OpenStack. There's um, uh, there's a config drive. So instead of one of the problems with Zen Store is that it only works in Zen. And so one of the ideas was that instead of using Zen Store, let's use a just uh, a config drive that all hypervisors could support. And then the agents that we use could just could just you know read from that in a in kind of a hypervisor agnostic manner. Um, so that that's kind of on the table. And it's also it's there's also the idea of just moving more towards using a metadata kind of driven approach. To, to allow me guest agent um, communication. Any, any questions on uh, some of the hypervisors supported in OpenStack? What plugins are you installing? So the plugins would be like one of the plugins is a Glance plugin. Um, into with, into DOM zero. Yes. Yeah, they just they're, they're just going into like you know Etsy Zappy plugins and um, those are you know essentially the Python modules that allow. Uh, Send server to uh, you know download images, bring them online, take snapshots, all that kind of thing. Oh, that's another that's another feature that that um, you know in the OS API taking snapshots. I mean that's that's going to depend on your hypervisor, right? you know how that's configured. So. so the networking, um, the you know the, these are kind of in order of least complex to most complex. Um, these are the network managers in OpenStack. So there's a flat network manager, which 
it's it's very simple. It doesn't do much, that much for you, um, you know, except that it, it kind of you know assigns your your VM, your instance, you know, an, an IP, and, and you know, uh, make sure that you know Zen Server or Libvirt configures that correctly. Um, you know, other than that, it's not going to do you know anything else. Um, the um, DHCP network service would allow. So if you're using DHCP, you can use a metadata service, and and then I guess you know do a cloud init AMI style deployment. Um, that's you know that one's pretty popular. Um, I guess you know depending upon what you're trying to do, that one may or may not scale as well as the flat network manager. Um, and then the VLAN network manager. Um, you know if you want to if you want to use VLANs, you can, you can make use of that. So and then you know this is also I would say there's an interface. Or, you know there's you could actually add, you know, combinations. I guess if you had different um, networking needs, um, and implementing your own network in here. Um, so the image service in OpenStack, which is Glance, um, is used to store images and metadata about those images. And um, the API, um, the Glance, so the Glance API is actually exposed. It's currently exposed through Nova. So, like when you get slash images in OpenStack or you know via, via the OpenStack API, you're actually hitting Nova, and then it talks to Glance behind the scenes. Um, I think long term um, that may move to being you know a top level Glance service. So, in other words, Nova may not actually um, always um, be authoritative for slash images. Um, but you know, so so glance on the back end. So that's that's where your images are stored. You know, if you have a snapshot taken from compute, it would be stored there. And then any metadata about those images. You know, for example, if I make a snapshot and I want to make it public, or if I make a snapshot and I just want to put some some arbitrary you know, key value pairs on that, that's what going to store. Um, and this is uh, an interesting slide about you know, I guess if if you were to deploy glance, this would be. Um, I guess kind of your your typical glance deployment. Um, so there's glance has really two parts to it. Um, I think in Fedora it's just one package. So there's just one glance package. But there's really two separate daemons that run within that package. So there's an API server and then there's a registry server. And so you know the clients only hit. So the you know the clients would be you know, I guess you know Nova or the compute nodes. They're only going to hit the API server. So that's really the the, the entry point for that, but on a typical deployment, like if you're deploying a lot of, if you're deploying a large cloud, a large fire cloud, or a public cloud, you're gonna have a lot of API servers because you know they're downloading images is a very bandwidth intensive thing, um, and you know the API servers <coughs> communicate with two different things. So there's this, there's a registry server, which has you know, the registry server is gonna store all the metadata about your images, and it's the it's the server that contains the database. So it, it, it's, it's basically just storing the metadata about the images in a database. And then there's um, you know, a store adapter, which is pluggable. So you can choose your back end. So if you wanted to store your images in Swift, which is you know, another OpenStack service, then you could do that. And that would be how, how they're stored there. If you wanted to store them in S3 um, or on the file system or just you know, having it download them from a web server, um, you got, you know, those are all implemented. So, um, any questions about Glance? Yep. So uh, when you're a client, like you say, you're on Nova and you're accessing Glance, is it basically just a, a, a get and put mechanism? Like when you say, I yes. want to start a new VM, I have to get the entire image, put it on a local file system on the node you're running it on? Or are you exposing some sort of file system like semantics that you can run it remotely? Because you need to have a local, local image that you can access from, like, for example, the KVM command line. Correct. So, I mean, Glance is going to allow you to get and put. You know, it's a Glance. The, the Glance API is a RESTful API. There's a Glance client, and the Glance client would be used to upload and download right. images from the computer. So, Glance isn't providing like POSIX file system semantics. It's providing the, the get and the put, and then you've got to stick that image on a file system. But then you mentioned earlier that uh, you know you mentioned Libvirt supports migration, but unless you have shared storage between your nodes, then you can't do migration. So, how are you doing? How are you reconciling those two things that you have well, a local so, copy of the image on the node and you're doing migration? So I mean I, I guess so some of that as far as like you know what the public API or what the OpenStack APIs, I, I just 
there is no migration in, in the OpenStack API. There is no like migration call. Okay. Um, so I would say you know if you want to do a migration, there's there's like an admin API you can go do that. So it's more it's more that migration feature is I guess more for like a administrator maybe saying hey uh, let's get all the VMs off this host kind of thing. Okay. Um, in the OpenStack API, I would say however though that you could do a resize, which may depending upon your schedule or move you to another node. <laughs> so there there there's different things. That's not answering your question, though. You're, you're not entirely. It's, yeah. It's, so yeah. You're, you're talking about. Um, so d just an example. Um, I go to start a new virtual machine. Yeah. And it's going to go to a Nova compute node. Yeah. And that's going to call a Lance API to pull the image onto the local file system on that node. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So now, if I wanted to migrate, there's two types of migration: offline and, and live migration. Yeah. An offline migration would be, okay, I want to shut down the node on this first Nova compute node. And then I'm going to start it up over here, which involves a push and then a pull, so that you sync, you know, you get the latest copy of that node. Yes. Uh, or of that VM. But if you want to do live migration, it means you're running them on both both nodes at the same time. In which case, you have to have a single file system shared between multiple multiple nodes. It doesn't sound like that aspect of it is supported. So when you say migration is supported, you mean offline migration. Yeah. Okay. That's different. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a really familiar with. Libbert live migrations so much. Okay. So I would say that you might be able to configure it to work if you had, you know, I guess your shared file system. And, right. You know. I mean, you could always have Glance stick the file onto a shared file system, in which case live migration would work at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You had a question? Yeah. Um, so Glance supports AMI format. Uh, how do how does it realize the the to the hypervisor that is still usable. And Glance supports, I guess Glance doesn't really care about the format. Um, so if you have like an AMI format where you have, you know, a RAM disk, kernel, and image, you, 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 the metadata, you would basically have, you know, the AMI and then it would point to its kernel and RAM disk, and that would just be metadata. And then I guess, you know, when you were spinning up that image, it would just say, oh, okay, you want that AMI? Well, give me the kernel, give me the does that make sense? Mm, partial, because, <coughs> well, currently there is no way to run AMI format using OpenStack. Is that correct? Or um, I mis misunderstood the hypervisor list. So I, I guess I don't know what, to, to me when I say Amazon style image, I, would just, I just mean like, you know, AMI, you know, image, kernel, brand disk. That's, that's but, but what hypervisor understands AMI? Yeah, what, exactly. What, okay, so I, I mean, what, I would just say with libvert, if I had a libvert image that was split up that way, that would be, you know, an AMI style image. I guess Amazon uses Zenser, right? Uh, they don't use Zenser, they use Zen. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, I, yeah, so your your ask your question is, could you just take an Amazon image and run it on this stack? Yeah. Um, because because uh, it's advertised that uh, open. Uh, I mean, Glance, the storage, yeah. uh, supports AMI. Glance would store it, yes. The but, answer is but Glance would store it, but whether you could actually okay. make use of it okay. is dependent upon your uh, okay. right. but So I thought I heard conversations about Glance doing on-the-fly translation. So you would have your, much like Box Grinder platform uh, stuff, you would have your uh, raw image and you would say, I'm deploying to this node and this node happens to be a uh, 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 KVM, and we're going to deploy QCAL2. Right. Is that yeah. true? Uh, well, I mean, Glance currently doesn't do that. Okay. But I think I have heard that as well. I mean, so I guess having Glance kind of, you know, inspect right. and get, get a little more like, intimate with the images it's managing is definitely something you know, I'm talking about. But right now, I mean, you know, for example, you know, when I when I upload an image in for Zen server, it's like you know an, an OVF or an OVA file that um, is specifically I have to set the metadata on that image to tell Glance that it's that type of image. So, um, so there could be some work uh, done here to use like uh, tools like the VDV tools to do conversion, so you could store one image and then deploy it to many hypervisors rather than having to generate a new image for every hypervisor type. Yes.
Yeah, and actually, just to just to loop back on one more thing. So I, I did say all the services communicate with over the, the, the message queue. Obviously, the communication between Glance and Nova is using uh, HTTP RESTful calls. So it's one of the you know it's one of the services that's actually being accessed that way instead of over the queue. So Glance actually doesn't use the queue really much at all. Anything else? So volumes, I'm not super familiar with volumes. Um, the, you know, there is volume support in Nova, there, there, and there's actually an extension in the OS API that exposes that capability as far as, you know, for the compute capability. Um, but, um, you know, so they, they, you know, basically there is volume support um, to interact with, you know, iSCSI and LVM-based volumes. You know, you can create them, attach them to your instances, and build them. So, um, and, I, and there, there are some other projects on the table that may eventually come under the OpenStack umbrella as far as, you know, I guess volume as a service kind of. Um, so the Keystone project, that, like, as Russell said, that one is going in, or that, that one's now in, and it's going to be part of the Essex, and, um, you know, it replaces the Nova Auth Manager, and it's basically a token-based auth authentication um, and so, you know, what that means is just, you know, you authenticate with, with Keystone and, you know, no, you can then hit Nova APIs and then when, you're, when, you're, uh, when Nova makes a call on your behalf to Glance, that token gets passed through and that's how Glance can say, oh, you can actually access this image. It's actually similar to a Kerberos principle then? Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, and so, you know, Keystone's configurable about how long those tokens last for and, um, uh, like I mentioned before, there's some middleware there that allows you know Keystone to also work with um, some different authentication methods that like you know uh, the EC2 API would be So um, it you know it's it's one of the it's, it's one of the newer projects um, and um, there's actually um, a kind of an alternate implementation on the table called Keystone Lite. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a joke or are you serious? <laughs> no, you're serious. I'm not serious. Um, Brilliant. And that's really, I, I don't have any more slides. Um, I, I would say we can just have three questions now. If you guys, we got ten, or we got five minutes left. Five or ten minutes left. So, um, I came in a little late. So, uh, I don't know if you can talk about this, but like, uh, a while ago, Mark Shuttleworth basically proposed like EC2 EPA. You know, the Amazon API has be the canonical one. Like, to what extent has that played out? Like, I, I don't do server stuff at all. I'm just really curious. Like, how. Um, well, I would say, the, as far as like you mean Amazon, the EC2 API and OpenStack being the primary API. Right. Like, yeah. So, you know, Shuttleworth was basically saying, let's follow the leader. I think. Right. Right. I mean, it's. You know, I, well, I, I mean, the, so the OpenStack project is going to lean more heavily on the OpenStack API. I, that's just, I think, yeah. they named it that way because that's the API that they right. like. But, I mean, the EC2 API isn't going away. And, right. you know, I see it as a great, um, you know, compatibility layer for, for maybe transitioning into OpenStack. So that if you're familiar and you've already built tools around, you know, the EC2 API, it, it's, it's going to ease the entry into using you know, installation like that. Um, where it gets interesting is I'm not exactly sure all the you know public clouds plan on hosting both sides of the API. Um, so, but yeah. Shuttleworth isn't the only one who's doing that, and certainly not only for um, for OpenStack. But the problem is, regardless of who what the cloud project is, there's so much disparity between what the EC2 API will allow you to do. And what the platform will allow you to do, that no it's wants to just be, impractical. No one wants to be confined to what exactly. Amazon publishes. If all you care about doing is replicating exactly what EC2 does, that may be okay. If you actually want to innovate and do something awesome, well, if you're using the EC2 API, all of a sudden you can't unless it's something that Amazon has already done. Exactly. Yeah, it makes total sense. I was just, I don't know. I saw his blog post. I mean, I'm in the known community, so I don't do much service stuff. But I follow, I try and follow a little bit. I'm just curious how much effect that. Did you answer? Cool. Yes. You had a question? Yeah, so with the 
um, Keystone stuff, I mean, if it's Kerberos-like, was there any thought about actually, you know, having, instead of saying, okay, I want to use Keystone, I could use something like Free IPA or just a native Kerberos implementation? So Keystone's a middleware, and they'll they'll allow a back end of you know, you can LLAP sit on top or Kerberos of that. or okay. underneath this. You can, yeah. have, really? you can yeah. have your own, yeah, I mean, like, if, if, you're, if you're a service provider and you want to do your own off, Okay. The trick was they had to get it out of Nova, right, to make it to available make it, to so all of the services yeah, yeah, that exactly. show up in, Good. in OpenStack. Got so it. Swift, Swift had and still has like three different uh, authentication mechanisms and authorization mechanisms that aren't Keystone, and um, and that's sadly not going away. But um, you know, <laughs> effectively, you had Nova and Swift at the time that were going in divergent paths for. Authentication and that just wasn't going to work. Yep. Yeah, and so in Glance was the one that was kind of just holding off. Glance never had off, and it was like, well, Glance needs off. Well, we're going to wait till we get the authentication service. In the and then the timing of Keystone showing up, uh, you know, the week after Diablo shipped, yeah. uh, just made it, you know, it, it, it was yeah. taking some time to get it integrated here with SXM. Yeah. So. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you.